Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit worldafropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. Worldafropedia.com. The Institute is a series of lectures from September through June. The purpose of the Institute, and I'm Frances Welsing, the purpose of the Institute is to talk about racism. I'm a psychiatrist. I believe that we cannot have mental health as black people unless we understand racism. Everybody knows the word racism, but we have to understand racism in depth so that we modify our behavior so as to end it. Uh, The schedule tonight is going to be 7.15 to 9 uh, is the lecture, 9 to 9.45 is question and answers, and 9.45 to 10 uh, is going to be the tapes, we'll sell some tapes. Uh, Our guest today is Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., And we are really honored to have him speak. I consider him to be one of the most important thinkers. Now, he's very modest, and he will not go along with what I say, but I still consider him to be one of the most important thinkers in the 20th and 21st century. All the work that I have done, the Crest Theory of Color Confrontation and the ISIS papers, If it had not been for this gentleman who helped me understand racism, white supremacy as a system, that work would never have come about. So his work is very, very important, and I'm pleased to have him here. Uh, His son, Mark Fuller, is doing the videotaping, and Danny Queen, longstanding uh, recorder for uh, the Institute, So welcome, and Mr. Fuller is going to talk about uh, racism, white supremacy, and also talk about black male-female relations within that uh, context. This is Valentine's Day for some people, (laughs) so I thought that that would be an appropriate topic. So thanks, everyone, for coming. We will have a lecture in March, the second Thursday in March, and I will be lecturing at that time. I hope everybody can get a handout. I'm really trying to make certain that everybody who comes gets one. Anybody doesn't have one? Uh, Okay. Uh, We'll see that you get one. You can come and get one, and Mr. Fuller will start. Context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date. Wednesday, February 14th, 2018. So I have been told. Uh, I hope folks did not invest any nickels in the madness. Uh, Dr. Cambon, he talks about the horror days and how we invest our time and energy. I hope people uh, went about their business as usual. Another day under the system of racism, white supremacy. The sound clip that you heard at the beginning of the broadcast, 16 years ago to this day, 2002, February 14, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing was not out trying to get chocolate hearts and have some sort of romantic dinner 
looking for a dozen roses, she was at the Cress Welsing Institute with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. talking about the number one problem in the known universe, racist man, racist woman, racist child, the system of white supremacy. Uh, I thought that was outstanding to be able to uh, just recall what she was doing. Uh, this moment some years back might even have some folks who were present uh, at that lecture uh, to hear what they talked about that evening and connecting the day, in fact, as you heard Dr. Welsing, connecting that day's activities with black male female relationships and a lot of the chaos and, and conflict that has been going on there for eons and eons and eons. At any rate, our guest for today's broadcast, uh, really intimate connection to Dr. Welsing, uh, her sister. Uh, they have birthdays in the same month coming up next month, in fact. Uh, but she's been on the program uh, a couple times before uh, talking to us uh, about her late sister, uh, Dr. Frances Cress Welsing, author of the ISIS Papers, general child psychiatrist, <clears throat> also her own uh, lengthy legacy uh, as an activist, also fighting against racism, white supremacy, including her tenure uh, in the student nonviolent student nonviolent coordinating committee. Always a pleasure to have her with us on the program. Joining us once again, our guest, Miss Lauren Cress Love. Miss Cress Love, you're with us? I am, yes. Thank you so much uh, for being with us once again. Always a pleasure to have you on the program. Uh, anything that you wanted to say to our listeners before we get started? Well, uh, I would only uh, like to say I was surprised to hear Francis' voice opening the program and uh, the fact that it was a, on a Valentine's Day. Uh, how many years ago was that? 16 years ago. That was from 2002. 16 years ago. Right, right. Uh, so, well, I'm just glad to be here and to have an opportunity to share with your listeners um, 16 years from when my sister was on your program. Mm -hmm. She wasn't with us that day. That was at the Welsing Institute down at uh, Howard University. Uh, just, I'm thankful I was able to hear some of the archives. But, yeah, that was uh, from today, what she was doing with, with uh, the so-called holiday um, before we get started, because I definitely want to talk about uh, some of your thoughts also with Dr. Welsing and some of your own thoughts, uh, you, the importance of today and, and self-love. We talked about that before, uh, as well as your brother-in-law, <clears throat> uh, Robert Lawrence. Uh, I wanted to also ask, or I guess I'll, I'll start with uh, Dr. Welsing. Uh, it's been... I think about a year since you were with us on the broadcast and I'm sure you've had many opportunities to talk about, you know, her, her legacy and the importance of reading her work. Uh, can you kind of share with us one uh, anecdote that has stood out with you uh, that someone has shared with you when you learned something about Dr. Welsing over the past year or so? Well, I think that um, one of the things that I have learned um is how many people really that she really helped and how many people uh really were uh well let's take the institute because i uh, for the over 20 years have lived in chicago although i had lived in washington dc um, but for over 20 years, I had been in Chicago up until, uh, Francis died. I did not attend the Institute as such. Now, early on, because the Institute is over 30 years old, er, uh, early on, before she started having her, uh, the series at Howard University, it met at the Howard Inn. And uh, that was back in, I guess, maybe like the 80s. And I did have an opportunity to be at the Institute, but I never really was sitting in uh, the lecture because I sat on the door. So 
I didn't, I've never, over a long period of time, had the really, I would say, privilege of once a month listening to Francis lecture as people who have been a member of her institute have. So even though I knew and knew about the institute, and sometimes we'd be on the telephone maybe on a a Wednesday night, and she would say, listen, girl, I got to go because I have to do tomorrow is the institute and I have to uh, put my uh, handouts together or something like that. So I was very well aware of the institute, but I did not sit for over 20 years, as some people have who are members of the institute, uh, and uh, I didn't have the opportunity or privilege, I would say, of hearing her on, you know, once a month for over a number of period of years. And so I have been really impressed with how she has helped people at the Institute and how important a part of their lives her Institute has been and her teachings. That's certainly one thing. And then uh, being back here in D.C. and having an opportunity to over, you know, just being here, uh, talking to people or some of her former patients or just people that were part of the Institute and others, how much she helps people and how significant her work has been. So it's really been, in a certain kind of way, uh, enlightening to me, I would say. Not that I didn't know that that her work was extremely important, but I've had an opportunity to talk to many people over the last year since I've been in D.C. after her death, um, people who've, you know, called the house or who uh, I see in the community who have said just how important her work has been and continues to be. Mm-hmm. Outstanding, outstanding. I I remember we had <clears throat> Dr. Umar Johnson uh, on the program a few months after Dr. Welsing's transition, and he said that that is one of the foremost things that he thinks about when he thinks about uh, Dr. Welsing is that this is somebody who, an exemplary scholar, uh, she could have easily, with her credentials, just went into private practice made a lot of money, made the study of racism kind of a little, you know, side habit or what have you. And, you know, yeah, yeah, that's nice. I'll dibble in that. And just made her money and went about her life. But she sacrificed so much uh, losing tenure at Howard University. And you talked about the the injuries she suffered uh, professionally uh, in terms of uh, the the American Psychiatric Association and how they viewed her work. And just, I mean, even the, the Welsing Institute, it took a lot of effort. It took a lot of time and energy for her to go and do that institute for decades, uh, almost a, a kind of one man effort or one woman effort, excuse me, because uh, it's not like she had a whole staff going to help her put this together uh, on a monthly basis for years and years and years, uh, just tireless effort uh, to serve, really using your words, what you shared with us to heal black people, uh, just extraordinary effort over decades. Again, not just something she did once in a while and, you know, here or there, but for years, for decades of service to heal and help black people, uh, just what a legacy. Um, I know when you were with us previously, you talked about <clears throat> being in Dr. Welsing's house, uh, in DC, how much she read and notes. Uh, just she would find all these notes that she would uh, just write down things uh, about what, how it connected to her theory uh, about the system of white supremacy. Uh, have Has anything else stood out uh, being in her house now? Well, uh, <laughs> I would say certainly uh, the fact that she was constantly thinking and constantly making notes, constantly writing. Uh, and I never was aware of that 
until I had an opportunity, after, you know, following her, her transition to be in the house and to just papers and papers and papers uh, and books and books. Uh, she was uh, uh, she was a, a scholar, you know, uh, really an incredible scholar. She was thinking all the time, and the handouts that she passed out with the institute, the handouts were uh, are uh, a series of articles from newspapers and. Uh, magazines that she gathered over the month and uh, cut them out, cut articles out, pasted them up on on uh, eight and a half by 11 paper and then uh, Xerox them and put them in a package of maybe 20 pages or more uh, that she uh, put these articles together. And she did this for every institute. That was what she did. That was a part of the institute, as well as uh, you know, she. No charge and no fee was uh, a part of it. She did it all herself, and it was kind of like uh, uh, <laughs> I think about. And she had to have a blackboard. It was very important for her to have a blackboard or something that she could write on so that as she talked, she could illustrate or demonstrate anything that she needed to on a board. And it was very, that was a very important aspect of, of, of the Institute. Our mother was a Chicago public school teacher, and our mother taught school for over 45 years in Chicago. And so I think that um, somehow the teaching aspect uh, um, rubbed off on her. And I would say also on me because I am a founder of a uh, public school in Chicago. And I never thought about what I've done in relation to, you know, what Francis has done and the influence of our mother, I never thought of it quite like that, but surely uh, our mother's influence is there in terms of of the importance of education, the importance of continuing to help our communities. Frances talked about her cosmic assignment, and she said everyone has a cosmic assignment. One just needs to find what your particular uh, assignment in the universe is. And once you find out what that is, knowing that you, there is something that you, you must do, we're required to do, even though we're not conscious of that, but we each as human beings are, are called to share and to contribute in some way. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to have an institute or something big, but it is a part of our livingness and our global and cosmic responsibility to find out and to do something uh, to give back to, to the universe, and especially as people of African descent. There's such a great need. So that we each have a cosmic assignment, and uh, I guess that uh, for Frances, the the work that she did, and I would say her work continues, so the work that she created and that continues to be there was certainly part of her cosmic assignment. Mm -hmm. In rereading the ISIS papers and... Uh, rethinking about her work more. Uh, I saw that and that's another thing that I wish I had asked her about because I think in the ISIS paper she she talks about that as her her cosmic duty, her cosmic assignment as you said, uh, with regards to replacing white supremacy with 
justice. Uh, just mm -hmm. can you uh, speak to that more where you said, hey, everybody has a cosmic assignment, Dr. Welsing. Uh, her efforts, that was her, that was her cosmic assignment. We all had uh, a cosmic duty. Uh, can you mm -hmm. speak to that just a little bit more? Well, I think that, well, let me back up and let me say that more recently, and I think since I have been here, uh, back in D.C. and being in Francis's home, uh, one of the things that I have been thinking about is, and well, let me well, let me just say, I have to back up a bit because we come from a family of uh, parents who were committed to our community. Our father was a physician, and his father was a physician. So Francis is the third generation of physicians in our family. Now, physicians are healers. And my father, as a physician, was not a person who went into medicine to to make a lot of money. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I, my mother was always vexed with him because my father just did, almost did not believe in charging for his services, literally. And uh, his father was a, uh, uh, a physician who died in 1909. So as you can imagine, when he started, uh, you know, early on studying and then uh, going to getting through med school, because he did not come from a family that had a lot of money. So he had to work his way through med school, as my father did, because his father died when he was about four years old. But our grandfather, who was a physician, was also a race man. And that was a term that was used back at the turn of the century for people who fought for the race. And... Uh, my grandmother always told us that uh, our grandfather spent more time fighting for the race than he did practicing medicine. So uh, I, I felt that Francis was channeling our grandfather, but I would have to say that we come from a family of, of healers, and and uh, people who were committed to the race, and so we, Frances, in in her great significant way, but also not even thinking about that consciously, the fact that I started a school in in Chicago that has an African-centered curriculum it's in its over 20 years now that that public school has been going on. So it's like we, we maybe unconsciously, because you too are fulfilling some kind of a cosmic assignment by bringing these uh, ideas to the broad community. I also am a founder of a public uh, a radio station in Washington, D.C., WPFW, that's now in its 40th year. And uh, that station also is committed to bringing information, uh, substantive information, uh, to a, pro well, to the black community, to the broad community, but with the black community specifically in mind. Mm-hmm. Is that, have I answered your question? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thoroughly. Context of white supremacy, Lauren Cress Love. Uh, I know for many of our listeners, uh, they talked about the stress that Dr. Welsing endured in her residence with all of the noise uh, and what they call gentrification that was happening around as 
uh, whites were invading the area, but particularly uh, the toxic noise that she had to deal with and disrupting her ability to, to think in a quiet environment, to rest in a quiet environment, uh, being in her residence, is the noise still a problem? Oh, it's worse now because uh, the block that her house is on, there were three houses, three residents, and then a school. And when she first moved and bought this house, uh, the school was uh, being used by the District of Columbia for uh, children with special needs. And then uh, just down the street from it was the, the school, and then there were three houses. Francis's house located in the middle of the other two houses. And uh, over a period over a period of years, uh, the school started expanding and uh, brought the property around Francis so that uh, her house being in the middle, uh, the uh, it's the Jewish Community Day School, and so now. Her house is the only house that's there, and they are rebuilding the well they're destructing the original facility and then they're uh, uh, expanding the school so the noise is uh really 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 difficult very very uh annoying, and the jarring of the house. So that it really is a problem, and it is a problem of gentrification. But in Washington, D.C., as all over America, gentrification is going uh, full speed. And one of the... Um, uh, one of the aspects of what happened to my sister... Uh, and I would say that attributed to her death was the fact that her house was being, she was being forced to deal with her house and that the house has to be sold. Now, at the time and before Francis died, I had not really, really, I, I was aware of what was happening and the struggle, her struggle against the Jewish Community Day School, but she had been fighting with them for a long time, ever since they took the, the school back from uh, the District of Columbia, because I think that they owned that building years ago. And when Brown versus Board of Education and we had white flight began, many, I think that the school... Uh, just rented the building, uh, uh, allowed the city to rent the building. And uh, then once gentrification started really getting a foothold in the city, they decided to take their building back. Now, that's what I think. I'm not positive. I do know that they have taken that, their, you know, they took their school back. And Francis was originally annoyed because the kids, uh, the playground was next door to her house, and she was very sensitive to noise and sound. She had always been very, very extremely sensitive to to noise. And uh, as a matter of fact, here in D.C., there's a strip, a medium strip going up part of 16th Street where her house uh, is located because uh, the traffic noise became very disturbing to her, and she really struggled with the city to do something about the noise on 16th Street, which is a major street in D.C., and goes from Maryland all the way down to to uh, the, the White House, literally. Uh, but uh, 
we, our family uh, lived in, in Chicago, lived in a neighborhood that was one of the first neighborhoods or communities to be urban renewed. And this was back in the, um, the process started in the 40s where we ultimately were forced out of the house that we lived in as the whole neighborhood was uh, taken over and deemed a slum, and people were forced to sell their houses to the city. And uh, a, a new community was constructed that was supposed to be for white people. But at the time... Uh, in the in 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 the fifties, because black people were who had lived in the neighborhood were given the first chance to return, uh, and white people were not going to move into a neighborhood with black people. The uh, area became uh, returned to being a black area, but it was the first major urban renewal process in the country, and our mother fought very hard to keep our community and to not have to move. So this was the second time that that being forced out of your neighborhood or our neighborhood had happened to Frances. And I think that maybe quite unconsciously she was really, really affected by the fact that here, for the second time in her life, here comes a, uh, a the city or a city saying, no, you, you're, you're black and you have to move. So at that time, they didn't call it gentrification. It was called urban renewal. But whatever the name, it's still the fact of moving blacks out of the community. And this had happened also to our grandfather, my mother's father, who um, back at the turn of the century had a grocery store in an area that was housing uh, a developing University of Chicago. The area in Chicago is called Hyde Park. And in early 1900s, when that uh, area incorporated as a township, they implemented a restricted covenant. And so the blacks that lived in that area were forced out. And so my grandfather, who had a, a grocery store, my mother, this is my mother's father and mother, they had a grocery store. And back in those days, people lived upstairs over the store. Uh, and so they had this grocery store, and they lived upstairs over it. But they were forced to move. And uh, so they moved into a house that my mother and my aunts and uncles grew up in. And when my parents married, my grandparents gave them that house. And so we grew up in that same house. So from 1909 to 1953, or yes, 1909 to 1953, my mother had been in that house because she was there as, as, you know, with her siblings and her. And then uh, when she married, my mom and dad lived in, in that house. And so we were forced out of that house. And it was such a painful experience for my mom being forced to move. Uh, you had no choice. And this is the same thing that ultimately is happening to this house uh, where my sister, that my sister owned and where I am now, uh, you know, contemplating having to sell this house. So it's this concept of gentrification, black removal, slum clearance, whatever they call it because maybe every few few uh, or four years or so, they give it a name, but it's all the same thing. It's removing blacks from urban centers and without their choice. And uh, this time in America, 
this is very, very serious because we are being forced out of the urban centers into suburbs. And, I, you know, the word suburbs used to uh, have sort of a uh, prestigious idea, you know, people living in the suburbs. But the word itself is two words, is sub, meaning under or out of urban. Burbs mean urban. So it's beyond the city. And my concern is that as we move our force more and more into the suburbs, that's not the urban centers where people have struggled as African Americans, struggled for political power over the years. We will be losing political power. Uh, and having to to try to recreate something that it took us at least a hundred years to gain and and develop. So we as African American people need to be very concerned about this forcing us out of the urban centers into suburbs, which I say are Bantu stands. It's the South African plan of of moving. At, or what happened in South Africa, starting back in the 40s, where they forced people, the uh, black South Africans, out of the urban centers into townships. Um, so, I'm very concerned about what's happening now in our cities as we lose political power because uh, we're we're not there. The demographics will change. Hmm. When <clears throat> you visited with us last time, uh, one of our callers, uh, 909, Cow's Legend, uh, he asked uh, also to get your perspective on cannabis legalization. And you gave your thoughts within the context of some of the issues that you just touched on uh, with regards to racial dislocation, what they call gentrification, um, black people being ejected uh, from urban centers, uh, displaced, uh, and just not being able to maintain uh, a permanent, stable residence. Uh, you can't get comfortable, certainly can't pass that residence on one generation uh, to the next. To just got to keep a moving, uh, as Mr. Fuller says. Uh, but within that context of all of the different ways that we are being attacked to have more legal drugs. You've now been in Washington, D.C. for a little while where cannabis is legal, uh, recreational uh, use is legal. Have you seen any evidence to make you change your opinion and say, hey, maybe this won't be such a bad thing? Well, I really have not been really dwelling on that. I, I, you know, it's just not something that I have been giving a lot of consideration to. Uh, I think that, well, first of all, I do think that uh, the cannabis without the THC, from what I understand, does have some very substantive, significant healing qualities. Now, I don't know that for certain, but based on some of the information that I've read about, I do think that that's important. However, I think that the use of uh, and the encouragement of the use of any drugs that, uh, you know, quiet us down, calm us down, take our minds off of the work at hand is, is, is very dangerous. Uh, and certainly... You know, this was done with with opium uh, back during the opium wars in China, where you know people were just encouraged to 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 drug themselves out as the the country changed years ago. So, I honestly, I really, I guess I'm not really able to to really respond any more substantively than I did before. But I, w I would not want to say that the 
cannabis in and of itself is dangerous when it doesn't the the variety that doesn't have the THC uh, with it, you know, because I think that if this is a natural substance that can help people significantly uh, and maybe less expensively and naturally, then I think we should look at it. But I think the cannabis that's used with the THC, uh, that quality is very dangerous. And uh, people would, would be encouraged to use that as well as other drugs so that we are caught off balance, so that we are not able to really respond in the way that we need to respond to the kinds of things that continue to happen to us as people of African descent. Now, we have a lot of work to do that we are not doing. And uh, Francis uh, and Neely opened the door for us to understand racism, white supremacy. But now we must continue this this struggle and 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 uh to con- to begin to look at what does this hundreds of years under the system of racism white supremacy what has that effect been on us because it certainly has been a very significant effect and uh so what should what do we do? How do we rid ourselves or free ourselves of the burden of racism so that we can uh, continue the struggle for freedom and justice? Uh, that this is, I think, our next assignment. What do you think about that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think Mr. Fuller, I think one of the questions that he poses on a pretty regular basis is, uh, what is your reason, uh, for being on the planet? Why are you here? And particularly to add context, why are you here on a planet dominated by racism, white supremacy? Why are you here? Uh, and asking that question of black people, if it is not to produce justice, my oh my, why are you here? Uh, and what are you doing? If that's the goal, you know, produce justice. What are you doing? Uh, that makes total sense. Going back to what we talked about earlier with that cosmic assignment. Uh, what are you supposed to be doing? It it makes total sense to me. And I think uh, Dr. Welsing, I think great illustration uh, of that point. Uh, all, Speaking of great illustration, uh, one of the things that prompted us wanting to to speak to you today, uh, Ms. Questlove, was uh, at the end of last year, your brother-in-law was Mm -hmm. recognized for his efforts to the United States space program with NASA. Uh, Were you at the ceremony in December? Yes, yes, I was. I was at that ceremony in Orlando, Florida, at the uh, uh, Space Flight Center uh, to honor uh, my brother-in-law, my sister Barbara's husband, uh, 50 years after his death. And uh, it was a very significant, it was a significant occasion uh, Robert Lawrence was an exceptional person. He really, really was, and he was a uh, a genius in his own right. And uh, he was not the first black astronaut because he was the first person to... Uh, do the training, but there was a brother who was in the program, uh, Ed Dwight, prior to Robert. And Ed Dwight, uh, Kennedy, President Kennedy, had said that he was going to put an African-American in the space program. And so he did uh, require that they brought Ed Dwight into the program, but 
and this was before Bob came in the program, but the day following Kennedy's assassination, Ed Dwight was put out of the program and sent to Germany so that he never had the opportunity be, to be fully uh, trained as an astronaut. So they, Bob has been called the first black astronaut, but I think it's important to acknowledge Ed Dwight, who is an accomplished sculptor and who has pieces, significant pieces in different parts of the country. But, uh, but then uh, Bob came into the program and uh, when, when he was announced, he was called an astronaut. But then there was a period in which they wanted to say, well, he really wasn't an astronaut because he did not go into into space. But and he died. But he died training another pilot uh, to fly a, this very special kind of plane, and uh, that was a part of of the training. And and this other pilot had attempted uh, to pass the training or the testing flying this plane twice, and he only had one more opportunity to uh, to take that test. And Bob agreed to uh, test him or t- t- to fly with him, and was killed as a result of uh, the errors that that pilot made. So, uh, (laughs) uh, what I would say about the program, it was an opportunity uh, to acknowledge Bob's significant contributions to uh the 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 program Bob was in the Air Force program there were two programs at that time Bob's program was the uh Air Force program and then there was a NASA NASA had a program Bob had applied to NASA three times uh and had been rejected three times but he was one of the top pilots and one of the uh, really, really best pilots uh, in either program, and that was acknowledged at this event in Orlando, Florida, when they acknowledged his his contributions after his death, fifty years after his death. Uh, he was uh, in 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 the. Omega, uh, the Omega Phi Psi fraternity, and the program in Orlando was also sponsored by the fraternity. And so, one of the things that was really wonderful, where there were so many African Americans uh, who were members of that fraternity who were at the event and who helped sponsor it, and so many of them had their children. So, this was an opportunity. For uh, young people as well as the rest of us, to to appreciate Robert Lawrence's contribution, but it was very good for young people to see the Space Flight Center and to learn about his work. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I uh, was reading different reports where they were talking about this event back in December, and they were saying with all the focus mm-hmm. and trying to get. Uh, black boys and girls into STEM programs and really promote, you know, science and, you know, mathematics and that sort of thing Mm -hmm. that that was Robert Lawrence generations ago. Uh, He was doing that PhD in nuclear physics, uh, as you stated. I mean, super scholar. I feel like we said that before about members of the Crest family, Uh, but super, super extraordinary uh, scholar. And you said with us on the previous program, uh, you talked about, uh, meeting the person who performed the autopsy 
uh, on Major Lawrence uh, and your speculation that there may have been foul play about his death uh, at this time period in the 1960s, all the racism, the space program down in Alabama. Uh, we've talked about that uh, legions of times, things that were happening uh, in Birmingham and what have you, uh, where they had the bombing of uh, Dr. King's house and, and many other vile acts, uh, Rosa Parks, Neck of the Woods. Uh, but talking about all the racism that he faced, uh, even in, in trying to uh, move through the ranks of the space program and facing lots of resistance, uh, I guess, uh, and, and make sure I, I emphasize before we go, Omega Sci-Fi's efforts uh, to promote and get the word out. I think you, you talked about the importance of their effort in making this happen. Uh, but just, I don't know, my, my feelings are ambivalent. I just wanted to get your thoughts with what you shared about it seeming that NASA, they were kind of pussyfooting, uh, perhaps even practicing white supremacy racism and saying, well, you know, Major Lawrence, he didn't really go into space technically. So he's not really an astronaut saying that to right. justify not putting his name on the wall and then saying it again to justify not recognizing the 50 year anniversary and just putting everything into context. I don't know how I would feel about a ceremony and particularly if there are any any thoughts, any any logical reason to suspect that there may have been foul play? I don't know how I'd feel about a ceremony. What What are your thoughts? Well, um, <laughs> I would have to say that um, there 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 is or was and still continues to be some ambivalence. But I think that it was also uh, important to acknowledge Bob as as he was acknowledged uh, this, this time, um, this 50 years since his death. Uh, when, he, when they have a memorial wall, to fallen astronauts at the, at the Space Flight Center. And uh, it took a lot of work for them to finally put Bob's name on that wall. Now, that happened a number of years ago. And, uh, you know, they fi- and it took uh, Congressman Bobby Wright uh no 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 Bobby Rush Bobby Wright is a, uh, the deceased psychiatrist Bobby Rush uh the congressman from Illinois as well as many others effort to finally get them to put Bob's name up on that wall so there was a ceremony for that a number of years ago but this ceremony was different and it really, I think, was kind of an effort to say, in a way, we're sorry that we did not give him greater recognition. We're sorry that we did not uh, really, really, really uh, acknowledge the significance of his work. Now, the other thing that we were told this time was that the work that, or that whole program was uh, um, what's the word? Uh, I'm having a senior moment. Uh, well it 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 was it was uh i can't get the word um it'll come mm. to you well anyway that, that was uh, uh the word is not coming but it, it what the word, what it means is that 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 program was was uh hmm. I can't get this word. Uh, it, it, it was a secret program. 
And so they have just uh, recently released that program for the public. And uh, so we didn't know how, how secret that work was. We didn't know what the work was for a long time. But it was a that was a space pop, uh, space spy program that Bob was in the Air Force's program at that time, and uh, only recently has that work and information been released. So uh, the fact that he was and and uh, it was acknowledged at the at the memorial that the fact that Robert was the only person of color in that program uh, had an extra aspect to it, meaning that uh, he would be immediately recognized. And since the program was a secret program, uh, there were some aspects or consideration on the part of the Air Force about that program and about Bob's base place in that program. Am I making sense? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Because of his, I guess, celebrity status as the first black member of the, you know, space program. Right, right, right. Yeah. With, well, I guess I wanted to read this as well, given the your response. When... His name was finally put on the wall. This is in 1997, 30 years after his death. Uh, The report Mm -hmm. in the Augusta Chronicle, uh, this is uh, first black astronaut honored 30 years after death. Uh, They write, while gratified that his father's name finally is on the astronauts Memorial Foundation's space mirror, Tracy Lawrence had no intention of attending Monday's dedication ceremony because of the antagonism or what might appear to be antagonism on the part of the board of directors, in quotes. They refused to recognize him. What do they call it? It was really unanimous refusal to recognize him for a period of years. Tracy Lawrence said last week from Chicago, where he runs a philosophical organization. The folks in the family have suffered a lot through the years because of this ongoing circle of non-recognition. Uh, powerful words uh, from his son, uh, from his son uh, Tracy Lawrence. I thought. Uh, any additional comments you wanted to get in, uh, Miss Cresslow? No, no. Uh, my my sister and my nephew never really got over the death of my brother-in-law. And uh, uh, as as really our entire family uh, has never totally recovered from uh, Robert's death. And uh, so my nephew's words and thoughts are uh, representative of how he feels. Mm-hmm context of white supremacy. I also wanted to point out as well, as you said, the work of Representative Bobby Rush uh, in Illinois. He was a former member of the Black Panther Party. Uh, Lots of efforts against racism uh, in Illinois and Chicago. His efforts as well as uh, the Chicago Crusader, a black newspaper. Uh, They also uh, published reports and, and recognizing and bringing attention uh, to Major uh, Robert Lawrence. Uh, talked for years the importance of black journalism. Uh, they contributed quite a bit uh, to the effort as well. Um, let's see, also with uh, today, I wanted to make sure I got in as well. And I guess I'll make sure I get for our listeners as well. If you have questions, any folks that are listening in, if you have questions uh, for Miss Cress, Love, the number to dial 641-715-3640, the code 564-943-POUND, press star 61 
if you would like to participate. Number again, 641-715-3640. The code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. I guess I get in one question really quick uh, in terms of, of making sure that black children in particular and, and just black people, period, uh, have access to knowing more about who Major Lawrence, Dr. Welsing, many others, knowing who these folks are and, and knowing about their work. Uh, just can can you talk about things that are happening to make sure that particularly children, because I know when you were with us before, you were really pleased uh, at the number of black children that were able to be present and participate in some of the memorials for Dr. Welsing to make sure that they were in touch with her work that was was really about betterment of black people and black children. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you uh, one of the concerns that I have uh, about with black children and 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 this media now and these cell phones and uh you know uh these computers which are more and more keeping number one us from reading and uh keeping us from communicating with each other. I think that we need to be, this is something else that we need to concern ourselves with because the significance of lack of communication, uh, you know, uh, among people is, is, is significant. I was at a birthday party and these are, uh, older people, these <laughs> are senior people like myself. And I sat next to a person who was constantly on her cell phone and texting. And this is a party. We had a birthday party. And she was not over in a corner. She was just sitting. We were at a long table. It's about 20 African-American women, all of them people who are achieved, you know, uh, doing community work, doing media work, all kinds of things. But she was sitting next to me, and she was texting and stuff. Well, what does that mean? And then I was at another party, and uh, <laughs> and uh, this was kind of a multi-generational party. It was maybe four generations at least of people at this party. And one little boy was, uh, had his cell phone and I don't know, he was texting or playing games. He was playing a game. And, uh, his father got upset with him because he had the cell phone and I don't know what his father felt he should be doing, but, and he was maybe like seven or eight. He was, he was, a, you know, youngster. But I'm concerned that we are spending so much time only communicating or not even or communicating with a machine as a com communicating with other people and i don't know what the what this ultimately will mean but i think it's something that we need to think about i think that uh i think that we have to really 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 begin to give more time to developing ourselves and to loving ourselves. And I think that the fact that this event is on Valentine's Day gives me an opportunity to at least say that I think one of the major problems that we as African Americans have is lack of love of self. My sister talked, talks about self-respect. But I just say love because we, the experience that we had, had over this last five to six hundred years has affected us deeply. And we have to take time out to work on loving self. 
so that we can then love each other so that we can uh, free ourselves. And it, the effects of racism, white supremacy on each one of us collectively but individually has to be dealt with. Uh, that's, so it's Valentine's Day. <laughs> and since it's supposed to be a day about love, I think that loving oneself and loving each other is vital to our survival and also for making it possible for us to be, bring justice to the planet Earth. Context of white supremacy, Miss Lauren Crestlove, on the program. Your commentary about cell phones. Wow, does that remind me of someone who has been on this program before? I remember uh, the summer of 2013. Doctor Welsing, she spoke about uh, cell phones, and she said. Uh, people, she talked about children especially, but just people in general, spending all that time uh, looking at really small screens, uh, whether you're watching movies or texting or whatever you're doing on the phone. But she talked about how that uh, drastically limits your your field of vision uh, and at a time where you need, they talk about Dr. King as a, as a visionary. I mean, if you're talking about a massive project, your cosmic assignment is replacing white supremacy with justice. You're going to need tremendous vision. Uh, she was talking about how that it just dramatically shrinks your vision, probably in many ways, spending all that time looking at a very, very tiny screen. Uh, she spent quite a bit of time uh, giving her cr clinical assessment of why that is should be a major concern uh, and something to worry about for everyone, especially children. But yeah, it reminded me of that. That was uh, 2013. It was wow. one week after the verdict in the Trayvon Martin murder Trayvon. trial. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. week after that, she was talking about those cell phones. Right. Well, you know, uh, when I'm living in Chicago... I am not driving, and Chicago has a very good uh, public transportation system, much superior to the one here in Washington, D.C. But so riding the bus, it gives you an opportunity to really kind of see what the community is doing. And so, uh, and a lot of, in, in Chicago, a lot of uh, young young mothers with children in, uh, you know, buggies, or not buggies exactly, but, you know, those stroller kinds of things that get on the bus with their children. And the mother will have a cell phone. She'll be maybe playing a game, or the baby will have one. I mean, these are little people who are hardly even walking by themselves, but they have a little play uh, cell phone in their hands. And so there's no communication between the mother and the child. The mother will even give the child her cell phone to to kind of play with so that she doesn't have to talk to the child. This is very, very, very serious. Not Lack of communication. Uh, letting the child be grown up by an object that you are not in control of. And this is one of the things that's happening uh, in our communities. People are not reading books. People are not talking to each other. People, I mean, you can be at a, as I said, a birthday party, and somebody is, is playing a game as opposed to participating with everybody. Or, you know, people just, maybe a couple are waiting, you know, make place their order at a restaurant. And are waiting for the uh, the food, the waiter to bring the food, and somebody is on the cell phone as opposed to communicating. Well, this is very dangerous. This is so dangerous because if we are going to have to move together collectively and individually against racism, white supremacy, and we can't talk with each other, 
and we haven't resolved the issues with ourselves and each other that have to do with self-love, then we're in a very, very dangerous, uh, at danger. We're at danger. And uh, as we move to the suburbs where communication is quite different than when you're in an apartment building and there are two or three or four different families or even more, where so you see people every day, you say hello, you whatever, you communicate, you communicate within the family. We're in, we're in, this is, does not bode well from my perspective. Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> we, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of scary times. And then if we have to endure at least three more years or whatever of, of this presidency, which is very dangerous. And, uh, you know, energy, we're energy. Everything is energy. And uh, the kind of negative energy that's being spewed out electronically is also very serious. And we have this kid going into a school today in Florida and shooting up people. I was I would lay all of this negativism at 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 the uh, foot of the current president because when you have this kind of negative when when is when is there some positive uh, when are the positive messages that are being need to be uh, spewed let's say uh, out. To 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 the nation, this is very 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 serious. Mm-hmm. You know, they say vibrations do travel, and they do. And uh, I have a lot of concern about just what's happening here every day in this country now. So we have to figure out how do we counter this negativism with positive energy uh, that we share with each other. Context of white supremacy again, our guest, Miss Lauren Cress Love. I was at a birthday party myself uh, this weekend and it was awful. Uh, if I had had a cell phone, that would have been the better option to just be on my cell phone the whole time. <laughs> Um, ah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> we had, uh, and also your your response also again reminded me of your sister who said about every single time she was on this program again, Doctor Welsing, a guest on the cows, uh, thirty one times. I think all thirty one times she said reading is more important than watching television or playing on your cell phone, uh, I might add. She used to say that all the time, and she lived it. Uh, If you could see her library collection, she lived it. So that is one I hope folks, uh, black people in particular of all ages, uh, can apply reading and writing more important than watching television. Uh, We'll check to see if we have... Any folks who dialed in, if they have a question, number again, 641 715 Four zero the code five six four nine four three pound press star six one if you have a question uh thomas in new york uh if you have a question line should be open proceed um good evening guys good evening um miss love how are you fine thank you um um i have a few two questions but i had a comment to make as well I want to say uh, I love when you come on the show. You sound so much like Dr. Weldon, and yet you're always very insightful. Um, You know, I really miss your sister. And in my opinion, she's the mother of black consciousness. And um, her theory on color confrontation, uh, I've rendered it not a theory. It's law. It's been proven time and time and time again. Um, So I, I think that it's the law of color confrontation. Um, and also, um, what you just mentioned about your family being, um, constantly relocated over and over again, it reminds me of Millie Fuller, who, um, always says, you know, every few, you know, decades or so, they, they move black people from one place to another. 
they never let you get comfortable. And I think that your commentary tonight proved it. It went from, like, your grandfather to your father to Dr. Welsing, um, just generation after generation. Right. Um, yes. Um, now, I, I have – I've never looked at it your way, the way you just said it, so I just want to know what, what, what was your take on my spin on uh, why they're moving black people to the suburbs. And I see the same thing here in New York and in New Jersey. If they're not moving to the suburbs, they're moving to the south. Um, now, I never looked at it from a political aspect or a communal aspect. I always looked at it from an expensive aspect because my family who lives in the suburbs, they all got money. And um, you need a vehicle. You know, everything costs a little bit more to me. Um, you know, you can't just go to the store whenever you want. Everything closes at a certain time, which means you got to have money to prepare. Um, you know, it's different fees and tariffs. Like, you know, in buildings, you don't pay water bills, you know. Um, you don't pay for garbage collection in the city. You don't pay neighborhood maintenance fees. What do you think about the financial impact that would be on black people uh, once they fully um, move everyone to the suburbs and out of the cities? Well, I think that uh, out of sight, out of mind. And I think that... Uh, People should should Google the Kerner Commission report. Now, the Kerner Commission report, the Kerner Commission was a commission that was established under the Johnson administration uh, to to look into the causes of racial unrest and and burning of buildings and unrest that was going on in the 60s. And uh, President Johnson uh, put this commission together, and uh, it was headed by former governor of Illinois, Otto Kerner. And their charge was to to look at and to discover the causes for uh, it, burning, a lot of burnings going on in different cities and stuff, and to and to make recommendations as to how to uh, uh, address these these serious concerns. Well, um, one of the findings of the Kerner Commission report, one of the things that the report said was that racism was as, um, in America was as American as apple pie. That's one of the... And so back then, this is the 60s, 67, 68, black people said, oh, right, see, finally they really said it. They really said it. But people didn't really read the whole report. And one of the recommendations of the Kerner Commission report was that blacks be removed from urban centers and relocated in smaller communities outside of the city. And so that is what is going on with this gentrification, which is quietly going on in different cities in different ways. So we are being driven out of the cities. Now, in Washington, D.C., uh, which used to be called the Chocolate City, you know, people were bandying around that idea, the Chocolate City. See, we this is us. But black people didn't, didn't control anything, really, in Washington, D.C. And... We didn't understand what well, we had a black mayor and we had a black city council. Well, that was then and this is now. And the way that um, gentrification has gone on in Washington, D.C., number one, in the 1970 census for Washington, the city was 70% black, but it was 70% rental housing. So what that meant was that for all intents and purposes, 
black people did not own anything in the District of Columbia. Now, you had some black people owning some houses, but 70% of the population, uh, 70%, even 65% didn't own, or 30% didn't own. And so once, uh, because what happened when Brown versus Board of Education happened here in D.C., you had quite like the white folks flew to the suburbs, as they did in many parts of the country. But then they get out to the suburbs and say, oops, we made a big mistake. We left all the, you know, the substantive uh, uh, qualities of the city back in the city. And now we're out here in the suburbs, and we got five kids, and as they get to be teenagers, almost everyone has to have a car because, and you know, there's not a, a little store on every corner. You can't just jump on the bus and ride 10 or 15 minutes or a half hour to a good shopping center. All that concerns and stuff. Oh, we made a mistake. Well, we want to get back in the city. Well, how did we get back in the city? Well, the current commission report said, move the black people out there and let the move the white people back in. And that's what's happening all over this country. And I believe, well, I believe that the beginning of this move started with the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Now, whether that was a part of the plan, I don't know. But I do know that we thought we burned, we got, we thought we were so angry with the assassination of Dr. King that the best thing for us to do back then was just to burn up our neighborhoods. And so that's what we did. And then we thought, well, okay, now the city is supposed to renew our neighborhoods. That never happened. So the renewal only began when white people got ready to start moving back into the urban uh, into the cities and uh, changing places with us. So uh, I see that we're in a very seriously dangerous time because you can get out to the suburbs and, you know, how do you deal? It's taken us over 100 years to develop the political power that we have developed broadly. And when we get out to the to, as we leave the cities, the demographics begin, will begin to change, and so uh, we will lose our strongholds, those that we have developed as African Americans. And when we get out to the suburbs, that's a whole different, uh, it's a different story. It's a different story. It's a different situation. Who are the representatives? Where are they? Well, they're in the cities. So, well, you know, well, how do, how do, who do I contact to get uh, some work done on on these streets, or or uh, the basements are flooding, or just any of the necessities? We don't know those people. It's taken us years to get to know the people in our cities who are who we are supposed to call on and to develop some skills. So now we're out in the suburbs, and what can we do? So uh, these are really serious, I believe, issues that we must concern ourselves with. Do you have another question, Thomas? Yes, I agree. Um, Thank you, Gus, uh, for letting me get my second question in. Um, I just want to know, it's simple. um, Have you been following the story of Jeanette Epps? the NASA astronaut who was um, slated to become the first black crew member to live aboard aboard the International Space Station, but somehow, you know, a few weeks or a month before, she was just pulled off and not a real good explanation was given. Her brother saying that it's racist. Have you been following that story? And uh, I'll mute my line. Thank you, Gus. Right. I No, I haven't. No, I haven't. But, you know... We live, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to laugh, but I want to say this is a racist society. 
You know, as Neely Fuller says, if you do not understand racism, white supremacy, what it is and how it works, everything else you think you know will only confuse you. In other words, this is just a racist society. And so it is almost... It is almost not is almost impossible for racism to not be a part of almost anything and any aspect of people's activity in America. Let me give you this is may seem simple, but there's a commercial on television with an African American woman uh wearing wearing these uh uh panties you know for for bladder control now why why she why does a, a a black woman have to be wearing these things why does she have to be advertising why don't they have a white woman a, a, a advertising and i don't think this woman looks that great in these panties anyway but you know so why do why do some commercials that have to do with sex and men always have to be a black man? You know, all it's just you know you if if you <laughs> I mean you could just have a day of being crazy if you just really looked around you at all the various aspects of racism, white supremacy and how it affects us. So, yes, if she was poor, yes, it has to do with racism. You just know that. I have not been following it. No, I haven't. But no matter what they say, no matter what they say uh, is the reason that she was pulled. Yes. Is she black? Was she promised? They, they, you know, was it her turn? And now she's not going? Unless there's a reason that she is actually ill and it's better for her health to not go, then it's something racist, yes. You know? Appreciate it. What do you think? <laughs> you know, I think almost that it's a, it, it's a terrible thing to, to, uh, to, have to just live in a country, and that's what makes us crazy. But the fact that, uh, oh, let me read something. Do I have time to read a little something to you guys? Yes, ma'am. This is from, and because I don't know if I mentioned this to you, this is something, uh, this is a statement that was made by George Mason. Uh, in July 1773 at the Virginia Constitutional Convention. This is just part of that statement that he made to these people, all these slaveholders who were gathered to talk about what they wanted to send and to say to, to Philadelphia as they you know, wrote the Constitution. Now, this, this, all these people were slaveholders. He was a, George Mason was a slaveholder, and all these people, because these were the people who had the money, and these were the people who had the power. He said, slavery, that slow poison, which is daily contaminating the minds and morals of our people. Every gentleman here is born a petty tyrant, Practiced in acts of despotism and cruelty, we become callous to the dictates of humanity and all the finer feelings of the soul. Taught to regard a part of our own species in the most abject and contemptible degree below us, we lose that idea of the dignity of man which the hand of nature had implanted in us for great and useful purposes. Now, this is just part of that statement. But this, the Constitution is not yet signed. And this slaveholder is, is causing, calling slavery a poison, 
which daily contaminates the minds and morals of our people. Now, he's talking about our people, our white people, us slaveholders. So what I'm suggesting is that ev- that the country started out uh, with racist with racist beingness as a result of slavery. When have they when have they corrected themselves? So the, it's it's the fiber, it's in the fiber, or yes, of the country. It's in the fiber of the country. And so this is what we have to look at. How do we, how do we uh, heal ourselves? How do we heal ourselves as a result of the damage that has been done to us so that we lose our fear, we gain our sense of self-love and respect so that we can straighten out our backs and straighten out our shoulders so that we can save ourselves because it's on us to save ourselves and free us. Nobody else will do it for us. Retired firefighter in Florida. Uh, If you had a question for Miss Lauren Cresslove, your line should be open. Proceed. Greetings, greetings, everyone. Greetings. Greetings. Uh, sitting here contemplating uh, the question I would like to ask, uh, it first came to my mind about maybe a week ago, and I was going to uh, uh, ask uh, uh, Mr. Fuller, but mm-hmm. when I knew when I knew that. Uh, one of the uh, Crest sisters uh, is on the program. I thought it'd probably be even a better uh, person to ask. And uh, so I'd like to ask uh, Miss Crest this question. Uh, the Me Too uh, efforts, have you heard about that so far? Well, yes, to some extent, yes, uh-huh. Uh, within, from what my observations uh, have been, uh, I've seen uh, non-white females, but I have seen white females involved. Mm -hmm. And anytime I see that, see that particular, uh, uh, make that observation, I have to figure that there's something that is not uh, correct with whatever may seem to be uh, correct, that there has to be some incorrectness involved with it because white females are involved. My question is, what are your thoughts on the Me Too uh, effort and its relationship with solving the problem of racism and white supremacy? Well, I have not invested a lot of consideration into the Me Too movement, Me Too movement. Not that I uh, don't consider it important, but what I see right now are white women um, generally of some substance uh, responding to uh, the the act actions of white men you know now. I think that we need to, and we're sitting there watching them, and maybe you, like me, are saying, okay, what about all this stuff that's happening to black women and that's been happening to us since slavery? 
and mm. continues to happen to us because this is nothing new. This is not this is not anything new that white men have been doing. And we black women have been the brunt of all this action and the reason we know that is because look how different we look for the most part than the brothers and sisters in Africa where we came from. So all of us have been victimized by by the uh attention and the forced attention on us by white men. I mean that's just what's happened, you know, down down the line. And uh, so I don't know whether maybe we're waiting to see and when if they go so far they will then finally touch on 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 racism because uh we could stand up and say me too uh in terms of every and that would be men and women uh black men and women in terms of the way that we have been treated in America every single day you know all the time in every single way so white women are doing their thing and uh when it gets down to down below uh the line of successful white women uh maybe uh people will begin to say well yeah i the only person that i understand said anything about black women was jane fonda and i understand that at some point early on when these revelations first began that jane fonda did say something about well you know something about well what has what has happened to black women but thus far uh it's going to be just a certain level of white women, I think, for a while. Now, I may be wrong, but it's going to be highly educated, for the most part, white women who have uh, relatively good jobs, who feel somewhat secure. And we also want to figure out how many of them are married so that if they lose their job, they have some backup because... Uh, all these things have to be taken into consideration. And these Hispanic women and black women who are in these jobs that are paying them relatively just uh, getting by salaries and stuff, they're always prey. They're always prey. But do they have the strength and ability to challenge and not lose their jobs or whatever, or do they have access to uh, lawyers, et cetera, if they do lose their jobs. So we'll see how far the Me Too, Me Too movement goes. Now, the other side of it is that what will happen, maybe, is that when when people decide to go to the polls, if we, if collectively, and if it affects not just white women in terms of the the demand in terms of uh the electoral process that will will have a positive effect but we'll just see uh, we'll see what are your thoughts on this call uh yes ma'am uh my, my thoughts, as I mentioned before, is the, is the distrust of white females. And I, I do understand in recent history, uh, I, I am reportedly uh, just turned uh, 60 uh, back in uh, December. And uh -huh. that says do, do, during my lifetime, uh, the care units, that some people call families, <laughs> uh, black families, care, our care mm -hmm. units uh, have have mm -hmm. deteriorated, deteriorated mm -hmm. immensely uh, during mm -hmm. that period of time. And mm -hmm. anytime I see white women around, 
you know, uh, I worked on, I worked on a job where, uh, they, the job started, uh, actually recruiting and hiring females, uh, white and non-white. I've always thought that was suspicious when, I, when white females would, would, uh, uh, it's almost like they almost like they're recruiting. They they recruit black females when it's some effort that they would like to pursue. Right. And uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately, too many non-white black females think that the relationship is genuine. And and it it I, I, I it does it, it it can't be it can't be genuine under the under a global context of racism and white supremacy. Uh, to, I, to, did you have to, another question? Sorry for interrupting. Just wanted to make sure we get to all our callers. Did you yeah, have another that, question? Yeah, that's true. I am too long with it. That, that's all. That's all. Because uh, uh, Miss Miss Wilson, uh, Ms., not Miss Wilson, but Miss Cress was just asking me about it, and I was trying to be as brief as possible. But uh, yeah, that's that's basically it. My I, yeah, it's just not a trustworthy thing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Logical to me. Uh, yes, well, you know, the white woman is just an extension of the white man, you know, and uh, right. they, they're all a part of a, a, a same group. So uh, she, is, she is stretching and uh, her wings and uh, getting stronger and stronger. But uh, I have not seen that many black women involved in Me Too. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but I'm not going to, I mean, you know, we're harassed all the time. When we, We've been harassed since we've been here. We were harassed on the slave ship, you right. know. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, and 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 in in the cotton fields, and in in our houses, in in the shacks, slave shacks, after we came out of the cotton fields, and anywhere uh, a white man decided he wanted to sexualize us, that has happened to us. So. Uh, Maybe it's that we just don't believe that they're going to make any real difference ultimately. And the white woman is still angry because they were sexualizing us in the cotton fields and stuff. She hasn't gotten over that yet, you know? Uh, Mm -hmm. So these attitudes of these white men... I'm glad they are addressing them to some extent, but it's just like get back. She's getting back for the stuff that's happened to her. You know, it's not necessarily to free us. It's it's to say, you know, we've been sitting around here for all these years ever since y'all, uh, since slavery existed. Uh, you know, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna get back at you. You know, and, you know, like. Thomas Jefferson was sexually a uh, uh, little uh, uh, Sally Hennings in Europe when he took her to Europe to be a, a companion to his daughter when he went to France as an ambassador. So, you know. Absolutely. Daniel Holtzclaw, Modern Times. Uh, caller, last four digits, 8448-8448. Did you have a question for Lauren Cresslove? Uh, you should be with us, 8448. Uh, yes, yes, I, I did have a question. Uh, it was actually in regards to, I know I, and uh, good evening, uh, Lauren. Um, I wanted to kind of speak to you in regards to, I know you had mentioned that you guys were going to do something, I guess, uh, in relating to Dr. Welsing. On another show that you had came on, uh, well, I guess one of the earlier shows that you came on this show, but I was just wondering, have you ever thought about possibly converting the ISIS papers over to the ebook or doing some type of audible? Because there's still quite a few people, or I would say an overwhelming amount of black people in particular, that 
do not know about the ISIS papers, and it just, you know, really, you know, uh, saddens me, you know, about, you know, the, the ability, you know, to, to kind of grab a hold of that material. And, yeah, you can get it, you know, from various different bookstores and stuff, but I was just more so in the, you know, in the mindset just, you know, being able to get it as an e-book or, or, what, or, or what have you. Uh, that's my question. Uh, I would say yes and no. Yes, we, uh, I have and some other people have, but it's, it, it, we haven't really kind of, uh, start pushing that idea forward. But yes, we have thought about it and yes, I do feel like it must be done, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yes. We have thought about it. No, we have not really moved to do it. But, yes, it's being thought about. Yes, because it, it really is very necessary. You know, it really is. Uh, especially since people are not reading. Is that what you're thinking about also? Well, I mean, you know, yes, and then also, you know, just looking at, you know, when you look at the millennials today, I mean, everybody, yes, people are trying to go away from the whole heart of so paperback, which I still love, but, you know, every, yes. everybody wants to have everything at the, at their, you know, fingertips, so that's what I was just, yes. you know, looking at there. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, you're absolutely right, you're absolutely right, um. We, uh, well, when I say we, you know, it's not, it's not no we, really. <laughs> uh, it, 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 uh, has to be done, and if, if you have some ideas about how to do it, you know, we can, I'd be happy to talk with you about it. Perhaps uh, the caller, if you want to drop me an email, until justice at gmail dot com, and uh, we can put you in touch. Uh, if you have any ideas that you want to share on that, or other folks, uh, right. as well, you can drop me an email and let me know. I know Pam uh, with Trojan Horse Publication; she was talking about that and might be willing to help out. Um, have to talk to her and see, but she had talked about that before as well with some of the same concerns. Uh, mm -hmm. The person who dialed in, I think this is Emmy. Uh, also in your part of the world, DMV uh, area. Emmy, if you had a question for Miss Lauren Cress Love, you should be with us. Hello, Miss Cress Love. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. I am very pleased to speak with you. Um, I think if I ever have one regret in my life, um, and I, you know, typically, like, if something bad happens, you know, you don't really regret it or whatever. But the one regret I have is having been in this area but really did not know um, or was not, I hadn't paid that much attention to Dr. Walding's work. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know about the cows at that time. I didn't know that she had the institute. I didn't know any of that. And it literally was like maybe... Uh, I want to say a couple of months or maybe even just a month after she passed that I um, got privy and uh, I listened to her as much as I can. I re-listened to um, any of the broadcasts that she's spoken on. I've scoured YouTube um, because she provided a lot of information on other things. I mean, it's all on racism, white supremacy, but um, on other things that I'm, like, searching for. And mm -hmm. um, so that is the one regret I have, that I did not get to meet her and having been mm -hmm. so close. I literally am, like, 45 minutes away from D.C. on a good day when traffic isn't too bad in this area. But anyway, all that being said, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to speak with you. The mm -hmm. uh, My primary question is uh, similar to the question that preceded mine, um, but specifically relating to the recordings that I know that the poet, I want to say Danny Love? Danny, Danny Love, Love, yes. Danny, that's his name. Danny, Danny Queen. Love, Danny, Love. Danny Queen. Danny Queen. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, 
I know he recorded uh, most, if not all, of the Welding Institute lectures that Dr. Welding gave. Um, Mm -hmm. I attended the uh, tribute in her honor. Um, So I did meet with him, and I saw that he had some CDs and whatnot. Um, I've reached out to him um, trying to locate that work, that body of work, also so that I can continue to do my own research. Um, And in the same respect that I know that there isn't like a massive team of people who are, you know, getting together to maybe transcribe the book into an an, um, electronic version, which I'll send Gus an email. I am, I would be honored to help in any way, help disseminate uh, Dr. Welsing's work, which gets me to my question. Um, Have you, uh, or are you connected to Mr. Queen? Um, Have there been any updates about all of that work um, and also, if it's possible, and see, the thing is, I think it, the reason I'm saying it to you is because I have said it, um, but who am I? Um, I I know that, you know, he recorded them and whatnot, and he has, like, certain CDs, but I'd like to at least put the idea out there, um, and I don't know, maybe you all have talked about it, to have simply an online database where people can just listen to all of those lectures and not necessarily have to uh, order them or get them on CDs or anything. So have you all had any conversation about that? I've really been working at trying to get as much of her work as I possibly can, and I haven't been able to get far. Right. Well, uh, actually, no, we haven't. We have not really... uh, yet come together and uh and even begun to figure out how to to do that and part of the problem well part of it let's say some of it is is uh i would have to take responsibility for that uh i don't know if you know it but uh both my sisters died within a month of each other there were three of us, and Francis died January, the 1st of January of 2016. And then my other sister, Barbara, died the 20th of February, 2016. So you can probably imagine, uh, <laughs> I'm not laughing because of it, I'm just laughing because of what it did to me, you know. And I'm still trying to recoup. So uh, I I personally have not had the time or yeah to to set to to deal with certain aspects of Francis's legacy. And those and that work must be done. So I'm interested in, I'd be interested in talking with anyone who has some ideas and you can get through me, to me through, uh, you know, uh, Gus. So, uh, because it, it, it is very important. Uh, one, one of the people here in D.C. has talked about developing a, a curriculum, actually, for uh, a teaching curriculum. Because I do, one of the things I feel is that you cannot just read the ISIS papers. You have to study the ISIS papers, you know, in order to make it a part of your thinking and your operating. It's not just, you know, like, well, this is a good read. No, it's beyond that. How do we then take this information and use it? on a daily basis to help ourselves survive this uh, uh, cacophony and and uh, how do we help other people to to begin to understand exactly what she was saying I mean her chapter on the inferiorization of black children is critically important 
her statement on on the fact that our children are our future, and yet are we really addressing them? Uh, are we, have we really figured out how do we address them and what is happening to them and why and how? Because I do believe that much of this media, electronic media, our children are being programmed. I come from Chicago. I've been living in Chicago for over 20 years, but I lived in D- D.C. for over 20 years. But And, of course, I'm certain that you know we have constant shootings every day. Well, if we think that that's just the way it is, that's one thing. But if we understand that that's abnormal, there's something wrong with that. So where is that coming from? And who is that doing that? And who is who is doing the programming? That uh, and where is that programming coming from? And how is it affecting our children? And do any of these games that are killing that with shootings and killings does do that, those do those affect the behavior of our children? Are there experiments going on? So uh, we there are a lot of questions that need to be raised. Uh, and within the context of the ISIS papers, uh, what, as Dr. Welsing said, that we should be doing and looking at. Mm-hmm. Appreciate that, Emmy, uh, for you or any of the other folks. Uh, until justice at gmail.com. You can drop me a message if you want to contribute or have ideas uh, about. Uh, getting Dr. Welsing's work uh, digitized or making it uh, more accessible. Uh, Caller Red in Nevada, did you have a question for Miss Lauren Kresslove? You should be with us. Hello. Hello, everyone, and thank you for taking my call. Hello, um, Miss Kresslove. The question that I had... Hello. Um, the question that I had, I, I know that you had um, spoke about having a school in Chicago, and please forgive me if you've maybe answered this before on a previous show. Um, I just wanted to know if you recall, like, maybe having any difficulties trying to, um, when you had the school or if you still have it, um, trying to make sure to be able to stay within that African-centered or Afrocentric um, mindset or, uh, like, um curriculum or um, subject area, whatever. And um, then also uh, maybe if you, uh, um, the reason why I'm saying this is because I know of a, another Afrocentric type school. And when I was in that school, I could see that they did have like a number of different um, white teachers and how the white people do have that ability to still, you know, practice racism under the guise of, you know, they're wanting to help. So I just kind of wanted to know, um, your your experience with that, and I'll meet my line. Thank you. Right. Well, our school in Chicago, number one, was founded or developed, created under a special initiative back in 98 uh, to start small schools. And Arnie Duncan, who began, became the Secretary of Education, under Barack Obama, was the superintendent of Chicago Public Schools at that time. And um, he initiated this request for proposals, and it was uh, uh, initiated and presented to the public, uh, community organizations, teachers, others, uh to develop to develop uh proposals to start what were called small schools and uh, i was on i was on a community org- a part of a community organization and chaired the children and youth committee and we found out about this opportunity and uh wrote a proposal, and it was accepted. I mean, it wasn't just that easy, but we were able to do that. So we're in a unique, and we implemented part of our proposal was to uh, have an African-centered curriculum 
Now, there were problems with that, but uh, because it's a public school and not a charter school, so that we were subject to all the other edicts of the public school system, which uh, has changed over the last 20 years. But we have been able to implement certain programs. One of the problems w with many teachers is that they're not trained to, to, to teach uh, uh, an African-centered curriculum. They haven't had that experience. They've, uh, and if they have, it's at the college level. The majority of people who really trained in, in Afrocentrism if we can use that word, as educators are or were teaching at the college level. That was their aim. The mistake that we broadly made was not understanding that that curriculum needed to start in the public schools, in Head Start, in kindergarten, so that now the part, of, part of the problem with, with African American studies is that the request for it has been limited because uh, the, those students did not start out with that desire, with that knowledge, with that desire for information. So it's getting cut off at the pass now, and they're cutting back on African-American studies programs at the university level. But... Uh, so we didn't have probably some of the difficulties that, uh, you know, some other schools might have, partly because there was a part of our, our purpose with when, when, when we developed the school was to have an African-centered curriculum. Now, we ran into problems and have run into problems because of the public school having to our school and every other school having to follow the particular program initiatives coming down from the you know from from the Chicago public school system. However, we do have some other aspects. We have a morning ritual at our school. Uh, every morning, uh, uh, every day, where the entire school gathers before class and uh, sings Lift Every Voice and Sing, uh, recites from the Nduga Saba, from, uh, recites from the Ma'at Principles, and uh, uh, repeats what's called the Pledge of Respect. And now they're repeating. I'm not, I'm not at the school. I haven't been at the school, you know, on a regular basis since my sister died. But... Uh, now they're also saying in unison, Eusini Perkins' poem, Hey Black Child, you know, do you know who you are? Do you know who you really are? So that morning ritual has tremendously affected our school and our students. So that you walk into that school and people immediately say, there's something different about this school. You know, there's something so, uh, I don't know if I answered your your question, but we've had certain advantages and disadvantages. But our school only goes from Head Start to sixth grade also. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question, Red Nevada? Yes, and thank you. I'll mute my line. Thank you. For sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, M. Handisi, did you have a question for Ms. Kresslove? You should be with us, sir. Yes, sir. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, greetings to you, Mrs. Kresslove. Uh, I wanted to, yes, ma'am. I, I wanted to ask you, um, well, one question is, uh, like if we were to, if we were able to solve white supremacy in one to five years, like what do you mm -hmm. think that process would look like? And my other question 
was mm. regarding. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I thought you were saying. Okay. My other question was regarding uh, Dr. Welsing's uh, something she said about possibly preserving or agree making, I guess, negotiations with the people who classify as white and possibly um, making a negotiation that will help them preserve uh, their state of albinism, I suppose. Uh, and, you know, in exchange for stopping white supremacy and now that um, now that she's uh, no longer with us, um, and I, I think um, by reason of white people, you know, uh, you know, should I'm just wondering, you know, is that real? Is that what we should should do? Um, help them survive, even though, you know, even though they're they're doing all these things, killing us. Um, and then the last thing was something happened very similar to my grandmother. Um, where they uh, took her property, the same school that she worked for, uh, took her property, and then she died, like, soon after. Uh, so, I, mm. you know, I, I just thought all that was, you know, real interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, where where was your grandmother? Oh, in Portsmouth, Ohio. Uh, she, had, she owned her house. And, oh, yeah. And owned my mom and my, my dad's house. They had bought uh, the house right next to her. Then the school took the mm-hmm. property and put a track on it, like a running track. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Well, I think that um, I think that uh, the stress that my sister was under in regard to her house had to do with her death. I do believe that. But I think that um, that it was cumulative uh, that from the time that she wrote the ISIS papers uh, and lost her job at Howard that uh, she lost uh, so a succession of jobs as a result of the ISIS papers and 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 uh the the pressure that she experienced as a result of of, of writing the papers uh she never won a she never won a court case starting with Howard and suing the university. Uh, she had great difficulty because uh, uh, she sued several jobs which she, that she ultimately lost as a result of people questioning, you know, the papers. Uh, and it was only relatively recently that people stopped thinking that she was crazy, uh, you know, and that they didn't understand what she was talking about. Uh, and people would, when I was living here <clears throat> in D.C. and was with her, people, you know, she'd be just any public place, and someone might be likely to come up to her and say, you know, I used to think you were crazy. I didn't understand. Well, the effect not so much of that, but the fact that uh, she lost her job at Howard, she lost several other positions, ultimately as a result of people, uh, uh, you know, attacking her uh, because of her papers, uh, because of ISIS papers, and then or Crest Theory first, and then ISIS papers. That ultimately. And then this house ultimately took its toll on her. And uh, a lot of times, you know, we are not necessarily totally conscious of the impact of, of racism on us. But there are many people here in the District of Columbia who are on jobs and, you know, especially working for the feds, who 
who are being constantly attacked uh, uh, and on on their jobs uh, because because of racism and the effect of that and the pressure on that uh, affects people affects our health but black people in general we're under a lot of stress and and it, much of it has to do with uh, racism, white supremacy, earlier experiences that we have, we don't recognize how affected we are in the present moment by past experiences. I have, I can just, just to show you what I'm saying, and I don't want to just bring attention on myself, but I would tell you that when I was eight years old, I was taking art classes at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I always was interested in art, and my mother enrolled me into Saturday classes. And an experience that I had at eight years old, where I was the only black. Now we're talking. I'm. I'll be 84 in March, so we're talking about a long time ago, when we didn't even understand racism. We didn't even know the word back then. But uh, I was the only black child in the class, and. Uh, it was a sculpture class, and the uh, t- teacher criticized we were supposed to model an animal, and I mo- modeled what I considered to be a, a lamb, and the teacher c- called it a monkey. Well, <laughs> I've never really totally gotten over that, and I, and I can tell because I know when I talk about it, I can feel some emotion attached to it. But and that's a result of you know being uh, concerned about the effect of stuff on myself and therefore on other individually psychologically for years and years and years and years. So what I'm saying is that there's just as Frances was affected by by the work that she did, we are all affected in many ways by are interfacing with races, and that's some of the work that we have to do. Uh, We have, whether we recognize it or not, there's a lot of fear in America of white people, the things that have happened to us individually and collectively have stopped us, so to speak, Uh, you know, stopped us in, in... right on the path. So we have to handle that so that we rid ourselves of, 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 of the strain and the fear of white folk so that we can collectively bring justice to the planet. Mm-hmm. Uh, DC, did that answer your question? I'm so, I'm sorry about the the, the uh, delay. I was trying to unmute myself. Um, yes, sir. I well, but I, I'm wondering, like, okay, but if we can do it, like, in one to five years, like, is it that we have no. to quit participating? Yes, ma'am. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. See, we. This is a mind game. Racism is a mind game. And we have to figure out how do we, first of all, we have a lot of experiences, many of us. Now, you know, it kind of depends, too, because I'm 80, I'll am i be 84 next month, although I can't believe it. But anyway, I'll be 84. My experiences are quite different than somebody who is 60. And... The, their, their experiences are quite different in terms of this country for people who are 20 because there has been much work done in terms of uh, dealing or trying to free ourselves, free our minds. But I think that there's still very, very much work to be done. You know, some people t- will say, t- say today, well, I've never had a racist experience. Well, I've never, no, I've never experienced racism, white supremacy. 
Well, you know, I would beg to differ, but uh, because this stuff is all around us, even if you not personally, if your family has had to move to to the suburbs because uh, there was no place to live in the city, then you may not have understood that that's racism, white supremacy, but that is exactly what it is. When we look at the television and still see negative images of African American people, uh, and and you know black men bucking their eyes, there's one on one going on right now about uh, getting your you know knowing your credit karma, where where she says something to him about I want to check my credit, and he he bugs his eyes and says. No, no, Lord, I'll kill you. Well, why is the black man pictured as the one who doesn't know and the black woman knows? You know, and he's bugging his eyes and looking like Sambo. And, and, and she knows. That's pitting the black woman against the black man, making the black man look, be more ignorant than the black woman. So, see, these white people, they they can't even help themselves. If you say, "Do you realize what you're doing?" They may not, well, well. What do you mean? What? But that's how they're the producers. They're design, creating these uh, images, and we're sitting there getting them, and we don't recognize what if we're not really keen. We don't recognize how we're being uh, uh, affected. I, as a black woman, what is, how am I affected seeing a black man act like that? And how are young black boys being affected or black men? Or do they even realize that they are being affected when they are being affected? You know what I'm saying? So uh, I don't think that it's going to be done in five years because, if we were doing it in five years, that would have meant that we would have had the answer specifically right now as to what to do, and then we would be spending 24, uh, 24 on ridding ourselves of, of these negative images. Somebody said something earlier about black families and the destruction of black families, which has been deliberate. The welfare system that was created back in the late 30s into the 40s with aid to dependent children where women could have, could, where women, a black family or a black woman could have as many children as she wanted to have or could have but she could not have the father of those children living with her in the house. It's been one of the most insidious practices, most insidious practices that's been perpetrated on black uh, people in this country. And we had seven generations at least of that particular program. So I, as a black woman, could have as many babies, and every time I had another baby, I got some more money. But the father or fathers, but let's say the father of that of those children could not be in the house, and there were social workers who were really police going in my house periodically to make sure that there was no black man living there. So what did that do? We have seven generations before they cut it, that particular program of male children growing up in a household without a, a father there every day. Uh, so what did that do? It taught boys, male, male children, how not to be fathers. It taught them that to depend on women because the welfare check went to the mother. So it the, uh train little girls to be in charge of the money and know that they were in charge of the money, and male children to know that a woman is in charge of the money and you go and depend on her. And all you have to do is look right now at any of these television programs 
where they, the, the judges and the courts and stuff, these judges. Uh, and there she is, a young woman, bringing him to court, to, you know, bringing him to court because I pay for his car note and he, and he won't pay me back. Or I bought him a cell phone and he won't, and he, ha- he hasn't helped me with it. Or I don't know whether he's the daddy or not. We are being, oh God, I can't, it's just, uh, you don't want to think about it. But if you want to understand about broken black families, uh, yeah, that was deliberately, deliberately, deliberately designed. I appreciate that, M. Hundisi. Uh, I wanted to check retired firefighter. Did you have another question? Um, just making sure we didn't miss anybody. Uh, retired firefighter, did you have another question you wanted to get in? You're with retired firefighter. Did you have a question or were you just listening? I'm just making sure we didn't miss you if you had another question, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Did you have a question or were you just listening, sir? Oh, I was just listening. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, I asked the question I wanted to ask. Gotcha. You. Gotcha. Yes, sir. Just saw your hand up. Grant, I think we nabbed all of our callers. Uh, Great. I don't think we missed anyone. Uh, as I stated, always enjoy having uh, Miss Cresslove on the program, uh, just getting more of her uh, remembrances of Dr. Welsing. And then as well, the important information about uh, her brother-in-law, uh, Major Robert Lawrence, as well. We had quite a few listeners who uh, they saw some of the different <clears throat> news reports back in uh, December uh, when they had the ceremony. This was before the the flood and everything, but definitely wanted to make sure we followed up on that. Uh, Miss Cresslove, we always are are so grateful uh, for you sharing a bit of your time and energy uh, to come and speak with us. Always appreciate hearing from you and we'll look forward to having you uh, back on the program again. Is is there anything you wanted to, to say to the listeners before we let you sign off and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday evening? (laughs) <laughs> well, what I want to say, first of all, I want to say to you that, uh, you know, the broad community is indebted to you for your work and for, you know, keeping this program going. Uh, this is very important because, you know, the definition of media is a message, and we really have to continue countering the messages that are broadcast out here. You know, cast and broadcast means to cast broadly. And so the negative messages that are broadcast or cast broadly that are reflections in one way or another of racism, white supremacy, need to be countered. And it's not easy, so I do know that what you're doing is a work of love, and and that's hard. But uh, so I just want to thank you very much for for you know for what you're doing for keeping my sister's name you know alive, but keeping all the names alive is so important. And if I don't know how how you do this, but if people, if you take subscriptions and people need to send in, you know, a dollar so to help you keep this going on because this is not cheap and, and, I, and I do appreciate it. And, I, and I, the other thing that I would just say is that we need to all find out, turn off the television. And I have to say that to myself because... I, I I I watch television. I do have to say that to myself. But let each one of us find out a little bit more about our cosmic assignment. And one's cosmic assignment does not have to be a big thing. It really doesn't. It could be a little thing. It could be something just maybe taking or being kind to a next-door neighbor who is elderly or not well or... It's our cosmic assignment. Everybody's cosmic assignment doesn't have to be 
writing a book, writing ISIS papers, et cetera, et cetera, would be surprised at just what it means to say some kind words to 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 a family or a friend or compliment someone on the work that they're doing, uh, giving them more incentive to continue. We don't do that very much. We don't do that very much. But we need to do it consciously. So uh, that's what I would say. The other thing I don't know if you know and if your audience knows, but Lerone Bennett, who uh, was the editor for Ebony Magazine for so long and wrote They Came for Columbus and his other book on Lincoln and continued to be a brother who who was really committed to to our black nation, died early this morning. He was at least 90. So he had been on the battlefield for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, we just, you know, just want to thank him for his work and his effort. Mm -hmm. And thank you for this opportunity to share some of my thoughts and feelings. Thank you for sharing your time uh, and expertise with expertise with us, uh, and definitely second that with uh, Leron Bennett Jr. Uh, I talked about the importance of black journalists earlier. Leron Bennett mm-hmm. Jr. would certainly qualify, and his biography on Abraham Lincoln is superb. Exactly. Uh, Forced into glory uh, is the name Forced of. Forced into glory. Yes. He goes over some of the racist jokes uh, that Abraham Lincoln told and his disdain for black people throughout the whole process. I mean, it is scholarly, well put together, definitely worth the read. Uh, LaRon Bennett Jr., another example uh, of a black scholar, uh, black genius, uh, cosmic assignment doing his duty right there, LeBron Bennett Jr. Uh, but just thank you again, uh, Miss Crestlove. As I said, we always appreciate you sharing a little bit of your time uh, with us uh, to talk about your work, share some of your views, and hear a little bit more uh, Life and Times of Dr. Welsing. We will definitely have you uh, back on the program. Uh, we'll look forward to speaking with you soon. I hope that you continue. Can I share one more little thing? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the the uh, prince uh, is is marrying uh, Megan uh, Merkel or whatever her name is, you know w- William. In uh, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Oh yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, I don't know if you saw an article a few weeks ago about one an event where one of the royals wore a pin at a reception and it was a pin depicting one of the early blacks in in uh, in the royal family mm-hmm. but she was accused of being um of of being racist but she really, I don't think she was. I don't know if you saw that article. But I don't think she was being racist. It was one of those pins that uh, was a copy of of one of those uh, drawings of an early black in the royal family. You know what we're talking about, thousands, you know, you know, back in the 1700s or earlier. So I think that, if people who are fascinated at uh in in uh, uh the, the uh uh texting and stuff ought to send her the, the, the and and there are some people who are really upset that he's marrying uh uh this uh mixed race person but in van Ivan van Sertima's African presence in Europe uh, is full of articles and writings and things, and so people maybe need to text people in the UK and, and, and inform them about that book so that they understand that black people they got the the British royals have blacks in their in in their line, and so does most of Europe. So uh, that's just something for people to do. 
I have to check on that. I did miss that story uh, from the past week, but I do know about the the whole hubbub and the controversy over this royal marriage uh, and and her being uh, a non-white person. I had seen some of that over the past few weeks or so, or however long it's been since they announced all that. But uh, yeah, I will I will do my homework uh, so that I can get up to date on that as well. Well, I'll give you another little insight into the Kress family. See, we grew up at uh, during the Second World War. We were uh, youngsters, right? Uh, Francis, myself, and my sister Barbara was younger than uh, than the two of us. But the Second World War, my mother, to get us to uh, eat our fruit and stuff, she would tell us that the little princesses, that's who the queen is now, and her sister, they were they were children just a little bit older than Francis and I. But my mother would tell us during the war that, well, the princesses don't have orange juice. You or oranges. You all eat your fruit. Uh, they don't have this fresh vegetables because that stuff was rationed in Europe. Well, it was rationed in America too, but far more rationed in Europe and in the, in in the United Kingdom. So. We grew up kind of feeling that we were somehow attached to 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 them in a way I can't even explain it. So uh, uh, we've also always had kind of an interest in the royal family, which my mother started by telling us when we were kids during the Second World War that we were able to eat better than they were uh, be- because of the rations. So... If it seemed weird, well, why is she looking at that or thinking about that? Well, that's really partly why it is, because uh, something that was instilled in us, myself and my sisters, many, 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 many years ago. <laughs> Lasting influence uh, from your mother, both from education and keeping up with royal politics. Wow. Wow. That's funny, but I really recognize it. I mean, I recognize where my interest and where it came from, right? Mm-hmm. Which also is a good lesson in terms of what we do with our children. Absolutely. You know, and how everything that we do influences them and how important it is to understand that, that, you know, we are responsible for the next generation of beings, and how in, invaluable parenting is. So with that, I will really thank you again for inviting me and uh, you know, say good night. Thank you, uh, Miss Lauren Crestlove. As, as I said before, always uh, just really enjoy having you on the broadcast. We will definitely uh, look forward to speaking with you again. And uh, Dr. Welsing would certainly co-sign uh, on that last statement. Uh, parenting super important. She talked about that all the time. Really, really value uh, bringing in, creating black life uh, and taking care, mm-hmm. preserving and raising strong black boys and girls, black children. Uh, Please take excellent care of yourself, uh, Ms. Crestlove, and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday evening. We will speak with you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good evening. Take good care. Context of white supremacy. Third time uh, Lauren Crestlove has been on the broadcast. Uh, I feel like learn a little bit more, get a few other uh, little details and things uh, from Dr. Welsing. I must say that was not planned, but that is one thing like for about a year or so, maybe even longer than that. I had really you know, felt some type of way about not asking Dr. Welsing uh, to elaborate on why she wrote in the ISIS paper, why she uh, describes her work against racism, white supremacy as being a part of her cosmic duty, why she phrased it in that way. I really wished I had, but 
compensation uh, to be able to get her sister uh, to explain that. And she brought that up voluntarily. She brought that that phrasing up. I thought that was so important. I don't think I've I've heard anybody else uh, refer to it in those terms. Mr. Fuller is kind of close, but even he doesn't uh, use that specific phrasing uh, to talk about the business of counter racism. Uh, It was great to hear her uh, expound uh, on that without it even being planned. Uh, With that, workplace racism returns tomorrow, as I said, trying to get back uh, with some sense of balance uh, to what we're supposed to be doing here. Workplace racism, uh, it's been a while, about two months since we've had the broadcast on and had victims of racism around the world contacting me about workplace racism in the interim. We will be back tomorrow. Uh, If you have incidents, trials, tribulations, problems, if you figured out some workplace codification in the time period that we have been down, that outstanding. Be the first person to dial in tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. We will be here. We'll be here on Friday for the book club, uh, picking back up where we left off with the wisdom of psychopaths, Kevin Dutton, and Saturday we'll be here for the compensatory call in. As I said, getting back into the groove slowly but surely. Uh, our nine year anniversary, no less, uh, as we get back into the groove. That said, uh, thanks to all the folks who tuned in. I hope it was a constructive investment of your Wednesday evening. Uh, I will add that I have continued with my yoga. It's been great. I feel great. And I have had all non-white instructors. I've had five yoga classes since Monday. I had two every day except today. I just had one. All five of the classes had non-white instructors. I would have never thought ever that If I wanted to have uh, just a plethora of non-white instructors, yoga instructors to choose from, including black males and black females, Seattle would be the place to go. I would have never thought that. I'm sure that they have in places where they have more black people like Atlanta and Houston, uh, larger cities like that, I'm sure. And even some smaller cities, I'm sure they you know, have tons of black yoga instructors and probably even whole classes of black people. I just did not think that such a thing would be easy to find here. And it has turned out to be very, very uh, easy to track down here. But it has been grand self-care, hugely important. I think that is a huge component of uh, black self-respect, uh, just being able to try to take care of ourselves as best we can in under extraordinarily toxic conditions of white supremacy. That's it. We're here tomorrow. Workplace racism, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Tune in. Don't be a spectator. Again, I know Dr. Welsing would co-sign on this one. Sobriety would be best under conditions of white supremacy. Racists, they have done a lot of damage getting us where our brain computer is not working correctly because we're under the influence. Uh, This is counter-racism economics as well. I think it would also be great for us to not spend a shilling, not a nickel on any of white's narcotics that have been used to dull the senses and thinking uh, of non-white people, black people, Worldwide, you certainly do not want to be in a vehicle, driver, passenger, even as a pedestrian under the influence uh, that just makes the job of every single Daniel Holtzclaw way easier. Race soldiers who are on the lookout to terrorize, maim, rape, cage black people. Let's not make it easy. Let's make sure that we can think clearly. Uh, and make phenomenal decisions while war is being waged against us, the system of white supremacy. That said, creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cow signing out. Thanks all.
for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, Your brother. Problem. You're a victim. Man, I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. <laughs>